What's up guys, Dollmatter here, and today we're going to be reacting to another CGP Grey video. So this one is the brief history of the royal family. Uh, so judging by the thumbnail, I think they're starting in 1066 with the invasion of William the Conqueror. Uh, but technically the royal family does have lineage from earlier uh, kings and queens of England. Uh, uh, kings, I don't think there were any queens back then. There, there might have been. There's definitely queen consorts, so I don't think there's ever a queen. That I'm, that I'm aware of. There, there probably was. There was like the whole heptarchy and everything. There was a lot of kingdoms in England. Um, but anyway. So this is starting in 1066 with William the Conqueror. And then leading all the way up to the modern royal family. Uh, which, well, I guess it would have. this would have been Elizabeth. But now it is obviously King Charles III. Uh, but regardless, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. 1066, the start of the royal family on these fair isles. Well, there were kings and many countries before that, and druids before that, and Pangaea before that, but we have to start somewhere, and a millennia- Yeah, the, the druids are that like, when you're talking about the English people, I think, you know, you, at the, er, 1066 is a good start date, because that's like the establishment of like the current kingdom of England, or I guess technically now it's the United Kingdom, but like the current kingdom. Um, but like the heptarchies before that, you know, the heptarchy was technically a certain time period, but, you know, the English kingdoms before that, the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms before that, I think you can start with that because it's still the same people, right? It's still the Anglo-Saxons. Um, but before that, the pre-Celtic people, that's kind of more iffy. I mean, technically, most English people actually have somewhere around 50% Celtic DNA. Uh, but, yeah, that's a little bit more iffy. Uh, but I, I think you could start with the English period. But then it gets so difficult because there were so many tiny kingdoms, right? Because... Uh, I can't remember who was the first that was, um, I believe the title was Rex uh, Anglo-Saxorum, which means King of the Anglo-Saxons was the, the original title, and I don't remember who was the first to unify it. And then it was unified and split apart, then unified again, but anyway. Ago is plenty far. If that leaves out Ethelred the Unready, so it will. <laughs> William the Conqueror conquered in the Norman Conquest. Norman here being code for French. Because it's the olden days, people had lots of. So uh, Norman, Norman actually does not mean French. It means, I mean, technically they were in France. Um, but Norman means Northmen. Right? They, so if you've ever seen the show Vikings, uh, largely fictionalized. A lot of the people in the series were not alive at the same time. They weren't related to each other, or if they were, it was not the relationship that they show in the show. It was much more distant, uh, because a lot of them weren't alive at the same time. Uh, but Rollo the Viking did end up getting Normandy. Uh, and it, it's the Northmen, right? That's why it's the Normans. Um, but yeah, the, the they were mostly of Scandinavian origin, but they had assimilated to French culture. Kids, but to keep things simple, this family tree is going to leave out many of them on each branch because not every child matters. So William had three kids we care about, William II, Henry I, and Adela. If you've seen the video about royal succession, click here if you haven't, you'll know that formal rules for passing on the crown will get established. But for now, it's a free-for-all home team advantage to the eldest son. But never forget, bigger army diplomacy. Upon William the Conqueror's death, William II became king. William II didn't marry and on a bro's day out with Henry died <laughs> in a hunting accident that gave Henry Henry won the crown. Henry won had at least 26 children, of which only two were 100% legit. He declared his daughter would rule next after his son died in a shipwreck, and swore his knights to honor Empress Matilda by crossing their hearts, hoping to die, sticking a needle in their eye. But when Henry won died while Matilda was in France, many ignored this while her cousin, Stephen, raced to Westminster using faster army diplomacy to get coronated first. Empress Matilda did eventually return and start a decades-long civil war that was pretty much a stalemate because turtling in the 1100s was an effective army <laughs> tactic. While she did rule part- well, That is so true. It's honestly kind of crazy how many, like, you read about sieges from history, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, they, they besieged the city for four years, and it, literally all that means is they were just sitting outside of the castle just waiting for either you starve or we starve. <laughs> Such a wild strategy. Part of the island, as Matilda never had an official coronation, her monarchical status is disputed. Now, as Stephen's children were either dead, disinterested, or a nun, his crown went to his nephew, Henry II, who had four sons, Henry the Young, Richard the Lionheart, King John, and... Jeff. Guess who died before his turn? Henry II <laughs> saw the history thus far of conquering, assassination, maybe, usurpation, attritional war, and decided waiting until after the death of the current king before sorting out the next king didn't work. So Henry II changed the system and crowned Henry the Young co-king with him, invoking the rule of two. One is none. 
2 is 1. If it's important, you need a backup. It was a good plan for stability, helped by the young king's popularity, but unfortunately, the apprentice rebelled against the master, rallying oh his brothers, which resulted in another civil war of disputed monarchs, during which Henry the Young died of dysentery, Henry the Elder died of fever, and Richard I took the crown. After Richard came John and four eldest son successions in a row. John to Henry III, insert Magna Carta here, to Edward I, Longshanks to Edward II, to Edward III. Actually, Ed II was overthrown by Isabel of France, aka the She-Wolf of France, aka, AKA his, his wife. wife. After deposing her husband, she acted as regent for their son. Every one of these arrows glosses over a bit of complexity. <laughs> Edward III had five sons, Edward the Black Prince, Lionel, John, Edmund, and Thomas, none of which would wear the crown. When Edward III died, his throne would have gone to the Black Prince, but he was dead at the time, so the crown went to his boringly named son Richard, now the second. There's a bunch of drama llama stuff around Richard II, which your English teacher might force you to read about, but spoiler alert, history's ending is always the same. Bigger army diplomacy. This time from Henry IV, who gets the crown, and Richard II gets starvation and captivity. Another Henry before we get to the War of the Roses, a war that strikes terror and boredom in the minds of students of history the nation over, who have to deal with this family tree simplified. <laughs> That, yeah, if you've ever seen Game of Thrones, a large part of the uh, the plot of Game of Thrones is stripped straight from the War of the Roses. Um, wh th this is true of like most fantasy, right? Especially like you know a lot of like very famous fantasy is either stripped straight from pr like you know existing mythology or existing history, right? Like Tolkien is very much pulling from. Um, you know, Germanic and, and Roman and Greek and uh, Celtic mythology. Um, you know, this, uh, uh, what's his name? R.R. Martin is pulling straight from the War of the Roses. It's pretty true in like most fantasy explain why everyone was angry. But the shortest version ever is Edward III's great-great-grandsons duked it out, even though one of them was dead for part of the fight, <laughs> but we can't get into that now, so Henry VI to Edward IV to Henry VI to Edward IV the end. Edward IV on his deathbed left his crown to his son, but being 12 he needed protection, so Richard, his bestest uncle in the world, promised to take super good care of him. Edward V then promptly disappeared under suspicious circumstances that left Richard to become Richard III. But he didn't stay king for long because Edward III's great-great-great-great grandson Henry VII took the crown, put a ring on Elizabeth of York to lock down that royal legitimacy, and then sired Henry VIII, splitter of churches and ladies. <laughs> Henry VIII thought it was high time to formalize the rules of inheritance, so he wrote them out in his will, basically saying oldest boys first, girls only if there aren't any boys, and Parliament approved the rules. Yeah, so th this is male primogeniture. Technically there's two types of male primogeniture. There's male preference and male exclusive. So male preference is, say, I have five kids. Um, you know, four boys, one or a girl. It'll go through all my boys, and then if one of them dies, then it goes to the daughter. Or if they all die, sorry, it goes to the daughter. Male exclusive means if my four sons die, it goes back up and then over and finds another male. Um, so England had male preference primogeniture. Which should have made everything neat and tidy, but we're about to enter the really messy time. Because Henry's son lived just long enough to screw it up, inheriting the throne at nine. There was, of course, a scheming protectorate running things, yet he still declared at 15 that his father's rules were dumb, and his sisters were dumb, and that his first cousin once removed, Lady Jane Grey, should be the next monarch instead. Mm. Then he died, and Lady Jane Grey became queen at sweet 16. Sort of, in a disputed status way, for nine days, until beheaded by Mary the first really, truly, officially, nobody doubts it queen. <laughs> Mary didn't have any kids and passed the crown to Elizabeth I, who became the second queen in a row to also not have children. But no problem, because Lady Jane Grey was next in, oh right. Now this is the point at which we acknowledge Scotland exists. <laughs> They've been doing their own royal thing, which for our purposes joins the English branch where Edward III's great-granddaughter married into it in the 1400s, and then goes James, 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 Mary Queen of Scots, James bringing us back to the 1600s. Henry VIII's sister importantly also married into this line of the family, giving it English legitimacy points in the eyes of the English Parliament, which asked to borrow Scotland's James, making him king of two countries, with two numbers in his name depending on where you're counting from. James yeah, so the funniest thing is this is where you have the unification of the crowns of Scotland and England, and Scottish people still act like they were conquered by the English, even though they got put, placed upon the English throne, which I always find hilarious. James had a son, Charles I, and- I mean, technically, you know, once, the, once they had the English crown as well, because England was such a more important country, the, you know, 
the now the, the rulers now living mostly in England did you know do some pretty you know fucked up shit, especially when you get to like the Catholic versus Protestant. I mean, Catholic versus Protestant stuff's already kind of started, but once it starts to like get a little bit more serious soon, yeah, I'm sure he'll get into it. You might think this unification of the monarchs means the very messy time is over, but no, because Cromwell. Oh, Cromwell yeah. didn't like kings and beheaded Charles I, declaring no royals no longer, making himself the Lord Protector, which was in no way like a king, even though he was in charge and it was a hereditary office passed to his son. But the Cromwells didn't last, mainly because his son was a fancy country squire who didn't follow rule zero, keep the army happy, giving Charles's son, Charles II, the ability to re-establish the monarchy. Charles II had lots of children, all of which were illegitimate, leaving his brother James II next in line. But James II was Catholic, and ever since Henry split the church, Catholics yeah. had terrible approval ratings. But conveniently, he had nice Protestant daughters, one married to a Dutch prince who by the, the nature of these things was the grandson of Charles I. Bonus English legitimacy points, plus who doesn't like the Dutch? With James so unpopular and William and Mary so popular, the army and nobles pretty much invited the royal couple to invade and James to fled. Yeah, so this is called the Glorious Revolution. It's kind of funny because some people say this is where, especially Dutch people usually trying to troll the English, will say this is where the Dutch conquered the English. Uh, but they were literally just like invited in to take, to take the crown. Um, you know, in reality, the last time the English were conquered was 1066, but like some people put like a little asterisk because of this. Uh, but yeah, obviously, the you know, not exactly a conquering when you're just invited in and the army welcomes you because they hate Catholics so much. <laughs> Led. William and Mary ruled as co-monarchs, but without children, the crown went to Queen Anne, who also didn't produce any heirs, though not from lack of effort. She was pregnant 17 times. Again, finding themselves with a no royals, no longer situation, Parliament decided it was really, truly, seriously the time to sort out the rules of inheritance, to avoid pretenders from every branch of this messy tree fighting over the crown. Parliament did a royal reboot to clear the cruft, defining Sophia of Hanover, the granddaughter of James Duel numbers to be the new starting point for all claims to the crown. These rules finally stuck, thus ending the very messy time. George I, son of Sophia, was the first king under the new rules, then his son George II to George III, and even though he lost America and his mind, never fear, the rules are here, so the crown continued to calmly <laughs> descend the family tree, going to George IV, who didn't have any surviving children, to William IV, who had ten children, all illegitimate, then passing through his dead younger brother to Queen Victoria, who started her reign in 1837 and made it to just over the finishing line of the 20th century, which in my opinion, probably the best monarch that they ever had. I, I think she understood the role more than anyone. One of the most fascinating things to me is, so at, at the time, the the you would always have these portraits where they would have like basically like strong masculine poses that would be like, the portraits would be like sent across the empire, right? You still kind of see this, uh, except now it's usually pictures and they look like very like office and diplomatic like. But at the time, they'd have, like, these strong, imposing looks to, like, show, like, a warrior king. And she didn't want that. So what she did with her portraits is she actually had her on the throne with her husband beside her doing, like, the strong masculine pose. And then she would hold the one child and it would have the rest of her children uh, kind of running around um, playing with her. Because she wanted to be seen as basically, like, the mother of, uh, essentially the mother of the British Empire. Uh, you know, she, she really understood the role, I think, better than possibly any other monarch is a doubly impressively long time given the state of medical technology then. After the end of her age, the crown went to her son, Edward VII, to George V, to Edward VIII, who finally breaks up this neat and tidy and somewhat boring line of succession by committing a scandal, marrying a commoner, an American commoner, an American commoner divorcee twice over. <gasps> Actually, the divorces were a real problem and weren't yeah. compatible with the monarch's role as head of state and also the Church of England in the 1930s. Edward abdicated to his brother George VI. Technically, they're still the the, the head of the Church of England, although I mean, Charles, so they used to take a title called Protector of the Faith. Charles didn't take this title, which was pretty controversial uh, among like hardcore Anglicans. Uh, but I kind of understand why. I mean, like the if you look at current birth rate trends, England is not going to be an Anglican country in like 20 years. 
who was reluctant to take the crown and then had to oversee World War II and the subsequent breakup of the British Empire, which drained the reluctant king's health who died at 56, leaving the crown to Elizabeth II in 1952 at the age of 25. Seven years older than Victoria, her great-great-grandmother was on her coronation day, but in early September 2015 Elizabeth became the longest reigning queen in not just British history, but world history. From Elizabeth II, the crown continues on to Charles, the longest heir apparent in British history, to his son William, to his son George. And that is a brief history of the royal family. Yeah. Yeah, so now, so now obviously we have King Charles, because this is uh, this is an eight-year-old video. We got King Charles, was it last year or the year before? I think it was last year, right? It was last March? I can't remember. I think it was last March. I think it was 2023, right? But, yeah. Then... The English, it's honestly kind of crazy that England is still a kingdom and like how, you know, every other kingdom in history is, for the most part, just doesn't exist anymore, but England still manages to somehow exist. But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.